So, um, in general, you wouldn't want your horse to be doing the attacking. You would, you would, uh, you would want your horse to at best stand its ground or, or flee and get you out of danger at the same time. <laughs> a very interesting point because you know there are some people who are either not no writers and never ever have a bit of your experience in writing and they think they know about horses and riding and they make some comments which i really say i always say if you don't know about something just don't do that <laughs> ask experts that have been, I, mean, I have always believed in this in my whole life i mean you don't need just to pass judgments and things i remember a guy was saying and even I could tell he's a bad writer. And it means a lot if I can say someone is not a good writer. <laughs> you see? And he was making a judge, I mean, passing some judgments or making some strange comments saying back then they used to teach the horses to bite and to kick. So the horses did the fighting as the man on the horse did. And I always, I looked at him and said, how did they do that? And then he said, the knowledge is lost. I mean, it's something which I really have hard times. You know, it's like, what is this claim? What does that mean? You know, what do you see? Well, there, there are there are some things like if if you see um, you know the Lipizzaners, um, you see some of the Odecol moves that they do, where you know they have um, you know Capriole, where they'll they'll sort of jump in the air and kick the hind feet out. And that could be used as a clearing move, right? So if you're surrounded by infantry, you get your horse to Capriole, that infantry is going to scatter pretty fast because the, you know, um, but actually targeting people with specific kicks, it would be really hard to train to do because you wouldn't want a horse to do that automatically. You'd have to train it so that it would cue and only kick when you wanted it to. Um, and, and, you know, it's not something, it's like something, you, it's sort of a last ditch, get me out of this situation rather than I'm going to go into this melee and kick this person and this person, you know. Okay, I understand. And then, um, so now let's come back to your teaching and your school, because back then when we were in Germany, I think you showed me some eye protection for horses, which were made of the same material like fencing masks. Was it you, Jan, that you showed me that? Or who was that? Um, no, no, I think, um, I can't remember who had that. Um, do you remember? I do remember, yeah. Um, Yeah, I, no, I, I do remember somebody had the, the neoprene masks with fencing, yeah, um, yeah fencing, yeah. Uh, do you have such masks for your horses during training or you just make sure that the horses are not, uh, you know, you take care of it, that the horses are safe and of course you do, but yeah. do you have any protection for the horses? when you We don't, we don't use them during training. Um, we, you know, we are just really careful. We also use nylon swords. I mean, not that not that a nylon sword in the eye wouldn't blind a horse if you stab it, but we are very, you know, we're very careful. We are only targeting each other. And, you know, the horse's head is a long way away. We don't do any, we don't do any jousting and we don't do any um, spear work at speed as well. So that's the most dangerous part is, is spear because that's where you can, you know, you can get hits to the horse's head that are, you know, would be quite dangerous. So we do we do spear work, but um, only only at a walk and and with just with sticks, not actual sharpened spears. And uh, please tell us what kind of uh, now. I mean, this was my question so far about horsemanship. Let's come back to weapons. What kind of weapons do you teach in your school? Like so, we mostly use mostly use long sword, so medieval long sword. Um, uh, we do uh, spear as well. Uh, those are the two main weapons. Uh, and we also sometimes do archery. We, we haven't done any in the last year, but uh, we used to bring in Robert Borsos who did Hungarian archery um, three times a year or something like that. What kind of um, draw do you use? Mediterranean draw, right? Three uh, Hungarian, so it's chest draw. Uh, th three finger chest. to the chest. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what kind of bow do you use? What kind um, of I have I have a Hungarian bow. It's uh, um, it, mine is actually one of uh, the Laos Kasai ones. Okay. 
So he's kind of the, the biggest, um, sort of the biggest school of horse archery in Europe at the moment, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, just another, you know, in Persian, and I don't want to go into archery because it's a big <laughs> field in Persian, as you know yeah. that. But you use, I mean, chest row exists in Persian archery as well, yeah. chest row. But we have also on horseback and tons of miniatures. There are uh, like a mustache draw and there are mm. also eyebrow draw on mm. and three different. And then there is one beard draw, I mean, four on horseback. Mm. So you use the chest draw uh, in your yeah. school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, regarding the long sword, back to the long sword. Um, do you mean like a two-handed sword or yeah. one-handed? Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're not super long. They're not like the German long swords that that you'll see sort of um, in later. The Fiore long swords are, you know, kind of about as long as my arm, um, the blade is, and and but it's a it's a two-handed or a hand and a half. And when you ride the horse, uh, can you please explain. Do you hold it two-handed or just no. one-handed? One-handed. The pommel is really useful. So it's actually really useful having that extra extra bit of pommel sticking out below the hand. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of plays where you can hook, you can you can hook the rider's hand, you use it as a pommel strike, you can use it to help throw. So it, it's quite helpful. And I find too that using a sword like that one-handed with that little bit of extra weight behind the hand actually improves the balance. Um, so if you have just like, say, a Viking sword, which has this, just the one hand, I find that very front heavy and, it, and much harder to use than a long sword, which has a little bit better balance that way. I understand. And then your protection, uh, do you use uh, steel armor or do you use fencing, historical fencing uh, protection? Um, we use a co combination of different sports. We use um, ice hockey helmets uh, with full plexiglass visors. Uh, so those are the closed visors. And the reason we use those is they are designed, uh, ice hockey helmets are designed to receive multiple hits, whereas a lot of sports helmets are designed for one hit. Uh, whereas ice hockey, they get, they can take a lot of hits. Uh, so it gives us the head protection for falls and the face protection. And then um, people use a combination. We have a usually just a leather or steel gorget, um, some sort of gambeson. I actually use a, a leather biker jacket um, and maybe some elbows and, and hand protection. So those can be like lacrosse gloves or HEMA gloves. Or... And why don't you use, why don't you use a fencing mask? May I ask? Uh, for the fall protection. Oh, of course. <laughs> so, I mean, I have I have sparred in my fencing mask, um, and I've only done it at times when you know we have a certain amount of loner gear, and and we just did not have enough hockey helmets for everybody. So, I I just sparred in my fencing mask. Um, so I have done that, and you know it. I don't like riding without head protection, um, I'll, but it was, you know, it's, it's a risk. I, you know, I a calculated risk because I grew up riding without head protection. <laughs> okay. Do you teach, um, I mean, just uh, there are some questions, you know, because I'm, I'm just asking because I, kept, I could imagine because some people of our channel ask what do you want to ask me questions. That's the reason I'm asking you this. So you, do you teach with stirrups, or, or, right? Like everyone else does, right? So you have stirrups. And do you, uh, do you teach also riding without stirrups? Is it necessary to do that? I mean, at least in Persian miniatures, everyone has, has stirrups. But is it necessary to teach uh, riding without stirrups? Um, it's good for you to ride without stirrups. It improves your seat a lot. Okay. Um, some, some schools of riding like um, uh, the Cadre Noir and some more, um, they, don't let their stir they don't let their students have stirrups or reins for about two years. They have them without stirrups, without reins and on a lunge line or a, or a long line. Uh, so we don't do that. We let our students have stirrups, but I, I do stirrupless work almost every class. Um, whether it's just, you know, practicing dropping your stirrups and taking them again. And at our various levels, we have um, 
think at level two, you have to be able to drop your stirrups at the trot and then pick them back up again at the walk because people, you lose stirrups all the time. So you want to be able to, you want to be able to ride without them. Please you should me. be able to do a jump course without your stirrups, right? You should, you shouldn't. You should, yeah. What? Jumping without stirrups? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, how do you do that? God, no, I'm you interested. Just... Well, I mean, you, you use your inner thighs um, and you kind of, you can sort of imitate two point position without stirrups. You have to grip with your knees. Uh, but yeah, you can, you, of course you can jump without, so you can do anything without stirrups. They didn't invent stirrups till, you know, the middle ages. So it's like, you know, the Romans didn't have them. Neither. The Greeks didn't have them. <laughs> and you teach jumping as well. I mean, please tell me, tell us, you can only learn jumping after you have learned how to write, correct? Of course, what else? Yes. You cannot do it before. So you teach people after you see they have reached some certain proficiency and they have somehow good writing skills, then only then you teach them how to jump, right? To jump with the horse, right? We start, we start teaching jumping um, over obstacles like that are raised off the ground at level three. Um, sometimes we introduce them at level two, um, but we don't test them at level. So at level two, they don't have to, they don't have to jump in order to pass level two. Um, we actually start going over trotting poles, which are just poles on the ground at level one. Um, and I, I just find that if people learn to jump, they tend to be more confident and more secure. Now, obviously, you don't need to jump to do mounted sparring. We don't tend to put jump courses <laughs> in, our, in our sparring rings. But, you know, Xenophon talked about, you know, jumping over ditches and and you know training the horse and the rider to jump and and uh it's other other people mentioned it you know um don duarte mentions you know out hunting and and going over obstacles so historically you would have to jump obstacles if you were you know hunting or out on the battlefield you you may have to jump you wouldn't be jumping, you know, five or six feet, but you, you, know, you, you do have to jump. So it's just, it's just another sort of way to improve the seat and improve confidence. And it's a lot of fun too. And you teach like, they jump like different levels of, uh, I mean, height when you want to jump with a horse or is it, uh, could you please help me? So for example, I wanted to learn jumping at your school. I come to your school. Yeah. So first yeah. you teach me to jump over an obstacle, which is maybe very, not a large one, right? So a small yeah. one, right? Okay. And then you keep increasing it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, first, at first you'd start going over poles that are just on the ground. So it's like that's and the horse isn't going to jump. The horse is just going to trot over them. But that's, that's to teach you you know, how to steer your horse and how to do a crest release so that you can let your horse take the obstacle without interfering. And then when you're good at that, then you would, you know, we'd maybe take you over cross rails, which are two, two poles that cross like this and the center is about this high off the ground. Cross. Mm -hmm. okay, and um, that sort of the V shape helps steer the horse to the center, it makes it a little easier. And um, at some point, and the main thing before you can jump is to have a really good two point position, which is when you just have your feet in the stirrups, you're not sitting in the saddle, you're balanced, all your weight is in the stirrups, you're hovering above the saddle. Um, and when that's solid, when you can do all your gates in that position, then you're ready to jump. Okay, very interesting, very interesting. And then if your horse hits the poles, they mm -hmm. uh, fall down, correct? They don't resist. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, unless you're jumping cross country. <laughs> what? So cross country, like um, the like the Olympic sport of three day eventing, there's a cross country component. Those are solid obstacles. So those are solid. They're you know at lower levels, they're logs on the ground and they get bigger, but they're solid. And but it, the, wouldn't it hurt the horse if the horse? Horse it's, a, that, it's a dangerous sport yeah you know like it's because they're solid obstacle 
obstacles, you get rotational falls, which is where the horse catches the front leg and does a somersault. So it, that is a far more dangerous sport than fencing or mounted combat or, you know, yeah. It's very fun though, <laughs> but I mean, it's- But I mean, I'm sure they have sometimes casualties, correct? Or- They do, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, it is, riding has one of the highest injury rates of any sport in the world, especially when you get, especially when you start jumping. Could you expand on that regarding injury? Um, well, I mean, just, just from a head injury perspective, you're, when you're sitting on a horse, your head is 10 feet from the ground. So if your horse falls and you hit the ground with your head, that's, you know, there's, concussion injury right there. Um, uh, Courtney King Dye, who's an American dressage rider, uh, Olympic dressage rider, uh, her horse just tripped when she was cooling out and she fell and hit her head and she didn't have a helmet on because um, this was only about a decade ago, but they didn't wear helmets in dressage and she, permanent brain damage. I mean, she's back riding. She's a Paralympian now, but you know, she's, it, so it can happen to even the best rider in the world can fall off a horse that's not even going very fast and hit their head. So there's that issue, which is why we wear helmets. And then um, when you add jumps in, there's, as soon as you add speed and you add jumps, there's the chance of a horse falling on you. There's the, you know, all those sorts of things. So um, it, it's, it's a pretty dangerous sport. <laughs> Yeah, it is yeah. like, you know, it, I don't know why, but it reminded me, you know, because I go skiing and then I, each time I have some very good coaches for skiing and many of them are professionals. And once I was doing that and one of them told me because I met many of them and then he told me, oh, he's not here anymore. And I thought he resigned and he said, no, he had an accident and died. Mm. And he was an Olympic level skier and coach mm. as well. And I was so shocked. And I said, why did you die? And he said, Manusha, skiing is dangerous. It is not that you just had such high speeds, right? And yeah. I was really shocked, to be honest with you. you know, I remember last yeah. time when we were in France skiing and hearing this, you know, it really sometimes I said, God, he's not, I thought he, you know, you know I mean, they say he's not here anymore. I thought he yeah. resigned, right? Yeah. I said, oh, no, no, he, you know, and then, and then when you say, say that, I, was, I don't know why it reminded me of this, you know, because mm. of course you go, you're high and then head injury, this uh, type of thing. And there is, yeah, of course, she was Olympic level writer. I mean, as yeah. you said. Yeah. So there is, I mean, of course there is nothing you can do. And then now you go and have solid obstacles and you jump over them. Just even, and, and they do it because of, to show their skills or why do they do this? Well, it, it's, I mean, it's incredibly thrilling. I mean, cross country riding is so much fun, right? The, the, galloping and I mean you they are the at the international level they are working towards frangible jumps so jumps that do break apart when they're hit um but there's controversy about that because you get people who say well we've always jumped solid obstacles why should we stop now <laughs> um so you know but even with frangible jumps there are obstacles that you can't make frangible like drops and ditches and things like that so you know sometimes sometimes you have a horse jumping you know 10 feet down a bank to you know to a lower level or through over water over a ditch uh, so there's all sorts of you know natural obstacles on a cross-country course but I uh, you know I mean honestly it is it is the probably the one of the most fun things you can do on a horse's back did I understand you correctly? You said you jump with the horse and sometimes, let's say solid obstacle, the horse hits the target, I mean, this, and then you mm -hmm. obstacle and then makes a somersault. Did I understand you correctly? Yeah. Okay. And if- That's never happened to me. That's never happened. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not common, but okay. at, not at common. high levels, you know, at the, at the international Olympic, uh, the Rolex, things like that, you, you will often, you know, you'll get at least one or two rotate, bad rotational falls a year 